All right, so we're continuing on with the scene with the mad dog, Tim Johnson. So why did uh, Scout kind of comment on the fact that it's February? They see this dog behaving strangely. Um, and so there's some connection to it, it's it's not normal that the dog would be acting this way in the winter time. Okay, so it's abnormal behavior. It's something unnatural. Okay, so that's a common theme in this novel, of course, things that are broken, things that are abnormal, things that are unnatural. And so keep that in mind. And also we have a creature here Tim Johnson, who we're going to see in a moment, is a mad, diseased dog. And so there's also, with disease, something unnatural and abnormal there, something that's not right. So keep that in mind as we expound this scene. So they race back to Calpurnia, and she thinks, you know, there's some dog that got hurt or something. Um, but Jem shook his head. He's sick, Cal. Something's wrong with him. What's he doing? Trying to catch his tail? No, he's doing like this. Jem gulped like a goldfish, hunched his shoulders, and twitched his torso. He's going like that, only not like he means to. Are you telling me a story, Jem Finch? Calpurnia's voice hardened. No, Cal, I swear I'm not. Was he running? No, he's just moseying along, so slow you can't hardly tell it. He's coming this way. Calpurnia rinsed her hands and followed Jem into the yard. I don't see any dog, she said. She followed us beyond the Radley place and looked where Jem pointed. Tim Johnson was not much more than a speck in the distance, but he was closer to us. He walked erratically, as if his legs were shorter, his right legs were shorter than his left legs. He reminded me of a car stuck in a sandbag. He's gone lopsided, said Jem. Calpurnia stared, then grabbed us by the shoulders and ran us home. She shut the wood door behind us, went to the telephone, and shouted, Give me Mr. Finch's office. Mr. Finch, she shouted. This is Cal. I swear to God there's a mad dog down the street apiece. He's coming this way. Yes, sir. He's Mr. Finch. I declare he is. Old Tim Johnson. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. She hung up and shook her head when we tried to ask her what Atticus had said. She rattled the telephone hook and said, Miss Eula May, now ma'am, I'm through talking to Mr. Finch. Please don't connect me no more. Listen, Miss Eula May, you can call Miss Rachel and Miss Stephanie Crawford and whoever's got a phone on the street and tell them a mad dog's coming. Please, ma'am. Calpurnia listened. I know it's February, Miss Eula May, but I know a mad dog when I see one. Please, ma'am, hurry. All right, so we get this repetition about this issue of February. So I guess we have something going on in terms of the behavior of the dog. Um, this was typical in summer time. And probably, you know, what, what we're kind of thinking of here is actually uh, rabies or some other disease for dogs to get. And if they get rabies, they go crazy and they if they bite you it's contagious okay so if they make contact and bite you it's contagious you get infected with the disease of rabies but i guess this is something that normally typically it would be in the summer so it's weird that this is happening in February okay so we want to think through you know the gothic connection here there's a number of gothic connections you have bizarre strange timing of an event plus you have a dangerous kind of seemingly unnatural or 
supernatural would be the normal Gothic way, creature. But of course, we're in Southern Gothic, so it's a little bit different. So we're more looking at unnatural rather than supernatural. There are monsters and, and ghosts and things like that in Southern Gothic literature. But just like with Boo Radley, he's not a real ghost. He's not a real monster. These are more now social categories. They're sociological and maybe even scientific categories. Okay, but the same principle applies. There's a Gothic element. There's danger. There's something terrifying and strange. And now we've got a monster. What are we going to need next? You've got a monster. Well, you're going to need a hero, right? To kill the monster. So normally it'd be a uh, knight, you know, a knight in shining armor come to kill the dragon kind of thing, but let's see what we get instead. All right, Calperny asked Jem, Radley's got a phone? Jem looked in the book and said, no, they won't come out anyway, Cal. I don't care, I'm going to tell them. She ran to the front porch, Jem and I at her heels. You stay in that house, she yelled. Calpurnia's message had been received by the neighborhood. Every wood door within our range of vision was closed tight. We saw no trace of Tim Johnson. We watched Calpurnia running toward the Radley place, holding her skirt and apron above her knees. She went up to the front steps, banged on the door. She got no answer, and she shouted, Mr. Nathan, Mr. Arthur, mad dog's coming, mad dog's coming. She's supposed to go around and back, I said. Jem shook his head. Don't make any difference now. Calpurnia pounded on the door in vain. No one acknowledged her warning. No one seemed to have heard it. As Calpurnia sprinted to the back porch, a black Ford swung into the driveway. Atticus and Hectate got out. Mr. Hectate was the sheriff of Macomb County. He was as tall as Atticus, but thinner. He was long-nosed, wore boots with shiny metal eye holes, boot pants, and a lumber jacket. His belt had a row of bullets sticking in it. He carried a heavy rifle. When he and Atticus reached the porch, Jem opened the door. Stay inside, son, said Atticus. Where is he, Cal? You ought to be here by now, said Calpurnia, pointing down the street. Not running, is he? asked Mr. Tate. No, nah, sir, he's in the twitching stage, Mr. Heck. Should we go after him? So notice just the dog's behavior. Okay. Erratic walk. twitching. He was described as uneven, like his legs were shorter than another person. All these behaviors is kind of like drunkenness. He looks like a drunk dog. He's all wobbling around and walking kind of crazy, right? So remember this connection, because the, the mad dog is a symbol, right, of something else. And actually, we're going to see it's a double symbol. So it's got two layers of meanings going on. Should we go after him, heck? asked Atticus. We better wait, Mr. Finch. They usually go in a straight line, but you never can tell. He might follow the curve. Hope he does, or he'll go straight in the Radley backyard. Let's wait a minute. Don't think he'll get in the Radley yard, said Atticus. Fence will stop him. He'll probably follow the road thought mad dogs foamed at the mouth, galloped, leaped, and lunged at throats, and I thought they did it in August. Had Tim Johnson behaved thus, I would have been less frightened. My throat's getting dry doing this reading, sorry. Nothing is more deadly than a deserted waiting street. The trees were still, the mockingbirds were silent, the carpenters at Miss Maudie's house had vanished. I heard Mr. Tate sniff, then blow his nose. I saw him shift his gun in the crook of his arm. I saw Miss Stephanie Crawford's face framed in the glass window of her front door. Miss Maudie appeared and stood beside her. Atticus put his foot on the rung of a chair and rubbed his hand slowly down the side of his uh, thigh. So here we have a very typical kind of gothic description 
and it's heightening the, uh, the drama of the situation, the desertedness, the stillness, the emptiness. Okay. There he is, he said softly. Tim Johnson came in the sight, walking dazedly in the inner rim of the curve parallel to the Radley house. Look at him, whispered, whispered Jim. Mr. Hex said they walked in a straight line. He can't even stay on the road. So notice he can't walk straight. What does that remind you of? Like a drunk person, right? He can't walk in a straight line. And that's even what, you know, cops, if they pull you over and you've been drinking, they make you walk along a straight line. He looks more sick than anything, I said. Let anything get in front of him and it comes straight at it. Mr. Tate put his hand to his forehead and leaned forward. He's got it all right, Mr. Finch. Tim Johnson was advancing at a snail's pace, but he was not playing or sniffing at foliage. He seemed dedicated to one course and motivated by an invisible force that was inching toward us. Right, we'll come back to that. We could see him shiver like a horse shedding flies. His jaw opened and shut. He was a list, but he was being pulled gradually toward us. He's looking for a place to die, said Jim. Mr. Tate turned around. He's far from dead, Jim. He hasn't even got started yet. Tim Johnson reached the side of the street that ran in front of the Radley place, and what remained of his poor mind made him pause and seem to consider which road he would take. He made a few hesitant steps and stopped in front of the Radley gate, then he tr tried to turn around, but was having difficulty. Atticus said, he's within range, heck, you better get him before he goes down the side street. Lord knows who's around the corner. Go inside, Cal. Calpurnia opened the screen door, latched it behind her, then unlatched it and held onto the hook. She tried to block Jem with me and me with her body but we looked out from beneath her arms. Take him, Mr. Finch. Mr. Tate handed the rifle to Atticus. Jem and I nearly fainted. Okay, so the sheriff, whose job it is to fire guns, wants to give the, the gun to Atticus, and Jem and I nearly fainted because they never seen Atticus shoot a gun before. Don't waste time, heck, said Atticus. Go on. Mr. Finch, this is a one-shot job. Atticus shook his head vehemently. Don't just stand there, heck. He won't wait all day for you. For God's sake, Mr. Finch, look where he is. Miss, and you'll go straight into the Radley house. I can't shoot that well, and you know it. I haven't shot a gun in 30 years. Mr. Tate almost threw the rifle at Atticus. I'd feel mighty comfortable if you did now, he said. In a fog, Jem and I watched our father take the gun and walk out into the middle of the street. He walked quickly, but I thought he moved like an underwater swimmer. Time had slowed to a nauseating crawl. When Atticus raised his glasses, Calpurnius murmured, Sweet Jesus, help him, and put her hands to her cheeks. Atticus pushed his glasses to his forehead. They slipped down, and he dropped them in the street. In the silence, I heard them crack. Atticus rubbed his eyes and chin. He saw, we saw him blink hard. In front of the Radley Gate, Chim Johnson had made up what was left of his mind. He had finally turned himself around to pursue his original course up our street. He made two steps forward, then stopped and raised his head. We saw his body go rigid. With movements so swift they seemed simultaneous, Atticus' hand yanked a ball-tipped lever as he brought the gun to his shoulder. The rifle cracked. Tim Johnson leaped, flopped over, and crumpled on the sidewalk in a brown and white heap. He didn't know what hit him. Mr. Tate jumped off the porch and ran to the Radley place. He stopped in front of the dog, squatted, turned around and tapped his finger on his forehead above his left eye. You were a little to the right, Mr. Finch, he called. Always was, Atticus answered. If I had my druthers, I'd take a shotgun. He stooped and picked up his glasses, ground the broken lenses to powder under his heel, and went to Mr. Tate and stood looking down at Tim Johnson. Okay, I only have less than a minute, so I'm probably going to have to come back for a short video to explain this. But can you think of what's going on with Tim Johnson here? The drunkenness, the madness, the disease, plus the madness. Who or what is this like? Okay. What could this be pointing toward? The fact that Atticus is the hero, right? He has to kill the mad dog. What what does that connect to? 
So we'll be back with a video explaining.